Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Book Nymph Live. And we are with Linda Reisenberg Fizzler today. Today, we will do a live Q&A. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments and we'll try to get to them. So let's get started. Hi, Linda. How are you today? I'm fine. How are you, uh, Kenya? I always want to say Nicole because of my character and you know, what we talked about at the release party. So, Absolutely. That's how are you fine. feeling? I'm doing very well. How about yourself? I'm doing very well. Had a bunch of errands to run this morning, but uh, other than that, doing pretty good. Good. I'm glad to so. hear it. <laughs> so we've been looking forward to this day for quite a while, and we're finally here. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's get started. <laughs> How about you tell us a okay. little bit about yourself? Where are you from? Where are you from? Uh, well, I live uh, in just north of Cincinnati, Ohio, um, in a real small, well, actually, it's not that small. It's a town between Cincinnati and Dayton, hence mm -hmm. the name Middletown. <laughs> and um, we actually decided to live here in Middletown because my husband worked in Dayton and I worked in Cincinnati. So uh, we split the drive between us and uh, we've been living here for about 20 years. I grew up actually outside of Cincinnati uh, in a place called Reading. And the, the joke right now, you know, um, Princess Kate and uh, Prince William had a baby and then they showed on Facebook, they showed the birth certificate and she had Reading written down as the place of her birth so now we're all claiming we're in from you know we're part of royalty so <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing <laughs> yeah yeah so it, it was the biggest surprise because my cousins and I were like wedding wow we really are princesses cool <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> so can you tell us what inspired you to write your first book well this is not your blind info is not your first book correct uh, well, actually, it's the first published book that okay. I've done. Um, yeah, I, I did some little, I'm an artist as well, and I did some uh, work or some real, like, fast instruction books on art, but I don't really count those <laughs> as <laughs> being an author or towards my authorship. Um, so Blind Influence is the, the first book, uh, and then while that was being published, I kind of wrote a little short story um, prequel called Blind Intention, which talks about uh, each of the three characters. So Blind Influence, it takes place in 1979. Blind Intention, which is the prequel, uh, takes place in 1964. And it's three short stories on Nicole Charbonneau, who's the female lawyer and the protagonist in the book, and then Sean Atkins, who's the MI6 agent, and then Senator Robert Jenkins, who is uh, also one of the, what I call the main characters. In the book, it's all of the books will center around those three in particular. Okay. Do you um, have a tip of, uh, Do you have a specific writing style? Uh, I just write. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I've I've been writing since I was a kid, and um, mm -hmm. so I guess I I just the funniest story I guess I could probably tell here is I signed up for writing. Um, in two different ways. I signed up at, at an English writing course down at UC, Un University of Cincinnati, and we walked in, and there were probably about 15 of us, and we were all sitting in class, and the professor does what the professors usually do, and it, it was just, you know, we, we kind of all sat there, and we were looking at one another, and giving each other kind of weird looks and stuff, and we turned in, she gave us our first assignment, we turned it in, we got it back. I think the highest grade from everybody that I talked to, I think was like a D. And <laughs> then she turned around and she said, you know, this is the best sentence ever written. And she wrote, Jesus wept up on the board. And we all kind of sat there and looked at it. Now, I'm not going to disagree that that is a beautiful sentence and it <laughs> conveys a lot. I, I'm not disagreeing that fact at all. But we just kind of all looked at one another and, and it just got worse from there. <laughs> It got to the point where she and I were arguing over the use of compound sentences and complex compound sentences and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, I just remember the, these words coming out of my mouth of, I think I'm past the point of C-spot run. 
And everybody <laughs> in the class started laughing, and I knew it was time for me to leave because I was <laughs> not going to pass that class. So that, that was one thing. And then the next thing I did is I took a journalism course, and um, the professor and I disagreed on how to sens sensationalize something. So the reason why I don't work at CNN today is because I don't believe in rushing to judgment and um, you know just keep putting all these facts out there to condemn someone when the media doesn't have the facts to begin with I mean they're just making this stuff up as they go along so I can't watch TV for very long or the media for very long without me throwing my remote at the TV set so um, so I guess between those experiences I just kind of got very discouraged about worrying about what kind of writing style I had or anything like that I I tend to I, I, I'm more of a storyteller, so I, I go in that. I don't really do narratives very well, or I don't do them very often, I guess I should say, because I did actually put a narrative in a contest here. That's actually, I'll find out if I made the short list, I guess, tomorrow. Well, good so, luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that would be like the first narrative I wrote. So I kind of. <laughs> You know, I kind of, I'm kind of like the person sitting on the outside of the story and just telling a story, I guess is the best way of, of saying that. Well, very good. You mentioned that you were an artist as well. Can you tell us how that mm -hmm. has impacted your writing or a little bit about your artist career? Uh, the interesting thing, I think it's the other way around where my writing has influenced my art career because I do a lot more writing um, about art. Uh, and get a lot more published about writing about art than I do <laughs> with my actual artwork. Um, mm -hmm. I've won a couple contests with my art. Uh, I consider myself a fine artist. I am in a gallery here in Cincinnati called Isley Fine Gallery of Fine Art, and um, I guess I've been painting for about 20 years. Uh, I actually left P&G to be an artist, so I'm just kind of new to this writing game, uh, actually trying to get published. Like I said, I've been writing since I was a kid. So um, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, my, I think my brother had a, a lot of fun going through the, my parents' house. Both my parents have passed, and he was cleaning the house out uh, so that we could put it back on the market. And I'm sure he went through everything I've ever written because there was still stuff up in the, the, my bedroom that I had written. So <laughs> he probably had a fun time with that. So. <laughs> Well, congratulations on your first published novel, Blind Influence. The reviews are coming mm -hmm. in, and they're very good. Can you tell us a little bit about the synopsis of Blind Influence? Uh, yeah, I guess the, the one-line sentence that we've been using or that I've been using is it's kind of like Jason Bourne meets the good wife in the West Wing. And, and the reason why I say that is because there's a spy who's Sean Atkins. He's an MI6 agent, and he's had this... Um, yeah, I don't want to say, well, it's a relationship with a uh, assassin. He meets them. That, that's part of what blind intention goes into. He meets them. He meets the serpent um, while he's being trained to become a British agent. And um, he ends up leaving the academy, uh, which is at Fort Moncton, uh, right outside of Portsmouth. Uh, he, he ends up leaving that to follow or be actually befriend the serpent and um, they kind of work together uh, with the IRA and Sean being in an undercover role naturally and um, then so that so as things progress they become adversarial and that's kind of where blind influence picks up um, it starts off with Sean on the, hot on the trail of the serpent and then naturally there's a number of things that happen between the two of them uh, through the years and um, so it, so blind influence starts with him in Paris trying to figure out what the serpent's next move is and then uh, Nicole Charbonneau who is an attorney ends up getting involved in this whole scenario that's going on between Sean and the serpent because she and Sean are the only two people in the world that can identify the serpent and they and actually be able to put him in the place which is Washington DC when he commits a crime uh, the serpent and then um, Senator Robert Jenkins comes into play is a very powerful senator he's um, from a Democrat from North Carolina and um, he is on the Intelligence Committee and what you find out later on in the book is there's a relationship that happens between uh, Sean and and Robert 
Jenkins, which I don't want to give too much away, but uh, they know each other. And so there's this nice little triangle that's going on between the three of them. Um, Sean is, has a lot of demons in his background, and uh, so does Robert Jenkins, and a lot of things start to come into play as things start to heat up between uh, the three of them and also the hunt to get the uh, serpent, to, to uh, bring the serpent to justice. Does that, <laughs> does that tackle it? it? There's a lot in this <laughs> plot. Is it, uh, a, lot, a lot of stuff goes back and forth. Um, it's, it's, I, I've heard words, uh, again, I'm not putting these, I'm not saying these, well, these are words that people have sent to me in emails because I encourage my readers to, to write to me as well as post reviews. But, you know, they say it's uh, page turner, it's gripping, uh, it's got a very, you know, great plot that's very gripping and holds their attention. So those are all, you know, very kind words and I, I appreciate those very much. So I agree with those words. The the story is very multi layered and it has a lot of intrigue which will, you know, appeal to anyone that loves a good suspenseful thriller and the characters are all amazing. So you did a very good job. And um, oh, thank you. I believe, you're welcome, I believe you just got um, an honorable mention at the Paris yes. Book Festival. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, it's, uh, that, was, um, <laughs> that was a shock. <laughs> it really was. Uh, it was, um, and I guess that what I need to do is like preface this a little bit. With my art, I have probably spent thousands and thousands of dollars to try and get into um, a semifinals of a competition to just get into a show let alone you know get an award so um, I was sitting here one night uh, in my house and I was out on the internet and I found this Paris book show and I went okay book starts in Paris there's a book show why not so I went ahead and and entered it in the show, and I thought, you know, it's not going to win anything. I mean, I mean, I, I, for 20 years, I've been trying to get recognized as a fine art artist. There's no possible way my first book will win an award. There's just, you know, it's just not going to happen. So I went out, and I, I sent it out. And then the other day, about three days ago, um, they sent a note saying that the uh, winners have been announced. So I went out to the website. I clicked on it. And the only thing that came out of my mouth when I saw the name you know, under honorable mention, it's a blind influence, Linda Riesenberg Fissler. And I looked at it and I went, oh my God. And then I just started <laughs> shaking. <laughs> and I just kept saying, oh my God. And my voice starts, you know, shaking and all this. And my husband's in the other room and he comes running in. He's like, what's the matter? Who died? Who died? And I'm like, no. And everything, nothing would come out of my mouth except, oh my God. And then I finally said, my book won honorable mention at the Paris Book Festival. And he just kind of looked at me and said, what? <laughs> so I repeated it again and then tears started flowing and it was just like you know and then I said to myself so this is what it feels like to win an art a competition <laughs> you know, it's, so I was like okay this is pretty good so good well, feeling I like that <laughs> it was very well deserved I'm glad you took Thank a chance you. <laughs> you're welcome so would you yeah, say yeah. who would you say is your biggest supporter <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a hard one. I've got, um, the, the reason why I'm laughing is um, because it's, you know, it's naturally my Tom, you know, my husband Tom puts a lot of, um, has a lot of patience because he'll be wanting to do something and I'll be typing away on a story. Um, so naturally he's, he supports me and um, my, my, I have two really good friends, um, Jamie and Deb, they, they're very supportive. And then I have a, um, two cousins and my, my aunt, um, who, bless her heart, is like in her 80s. She would probably just die of me telling, saying her age. But um, she's, um, she and my cousin Gail and my cousin Patsy are very supportive of all I do, in, including my writing. So I've got a, a really nice support system in, in place. And um, I tend, you know... You only hear about the good things. Like, if I hadn't won anything at the B Paris Book Festival, nobody would have known that I entered it. So. Well, good job. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> it's good to have a good support system. Um, do yeah, you, it is. Yeah. Do you, how long does it usually take you to write a book? Like, how long did it take you to write Blind Influence? 
<laughs> well, that one's a tough one because uh, I actually started it back in 1979, which is why well, it's set awesome. in 1979. <laughs> yeah. And um, that, it, so I guess I guess I have to explain a little bit. It usually doesn't take me 30 some years to write a book. Um, <laughs> But I guess what I should have done was brought in my big stack of how much handwritten scenes I've had written on there. But uh, it, back in 1979, I graduated from high school. Uh, my parents asked me, do you want to go to college? And I said, yes. And they said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to go out to Un University of Southern California, and I want to be a director. And my parents looked at me like, yeah, and we're going to go take off for Mars tomorrow. you know. And it's like, that isn't going to happen, Linda. And I said, well, then I don't want to go to college. And they were like, no, you can go to UC. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go to UC. I want to go to USC, just like George Lucas, and I want to be a director. And she's like, that's not going to happen. So we went through, you know, a number of conversations, and I, I decided, well, you know, if I, if I can't do that, then I, I really am not going to go to college. So I uh, started working at Procter & Gamble. And, of course, you're 18 years old. You're working in a business environment, big Fortune 500 company. And um, my head was still in the clouds. I was still writing stuff. And uh, it, then, like, I, I call it the corporate world reality hit in. And uh, for 26 years, I worked at Procter & Gamble. During that 26 years, any chance I possibly could get to write, I took. And I would, well, when I was single, I would come home on a Friday night um, from work all week, work all night, all through the night, get a couple hours of sleep on Saturday, late Saturday uh, morning, get up, write continually through Saturday, through Saturday night, and then into Sunday, and then go to bed about like 8 o'clock on Sunday and get enough sleep so I could get up and actually function on Monday morning at, at work. And then I would also work in the break area or um, at my lunch. Um, so constantly you would always see me sitting there scribbling in the break room on a pad of paper with a uh, pen and just catching any scene that came to my mind. And then about a... I can't remember exactly what year it was, but Star Trek The Next Generation was on TV, and I was really big into science fiction and science fantasy, and um, I decided that I was going to try to write a script for Star Trek The Next Generation, and I sent it off, <laughs> typed it all up, sent it off, and um, I, was even <laughs> I was even brash enough to send it directly to Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> so, oh, that's so. amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he signed for it too. I sent it register ma mail, and he signed for it. So I actually had his—I actually have his autograph somewhere on here on a um, green slip of paper that had a you know for mail registration back then. And um, Eric Stillwell, who ended up being a, a big name in the Star Trek Next Generation area, sent me a rejection letter back. And inside the rejection letter, I have—I still have it. It's downstairs uh, in my studio, but it's. Um, he had his nicely worded, well-written rejection letter with a lot of encouragement about what I needed to do. So he sent me submission gu guidelines. He gave me a little hint on what they were looking for in the letter. And then he gave me a list of agents because the last line said, we never accept any scripts unless they come from an agent. So in closed, please find the list of agents. So I, I have this list of agents with circles drawn around who I should contact. And me being in my 20s went, oh, it's just a rejection. They do that for everybody. And I threw it aside. And I got that out about a year ago. And I'm looking at it. And I just started banging my head against the wall and said, how stupid <laughs> were you? <laughs> so I said, well, if Eric Stillwell in that little script saw some hope, there's got to be some hope here. So I went in and I found, I started round, round, um, rounding up all of my stacks of handwritten notes for blind influence. And I started reading through them. And it took me about, a, in all honesty, it took me about a year to um, compile all of that, type it all out in Word, and create an outline from, I created the outline from it first, and then started typing everything out in Word, changing some stuff around. And um, so it took me about a, uh, about a year to really organize all of that. And then it took about, after I had it all typed up, you know, about six weeks to start editing and proofing it and um, going out to find a publisher to publish it. Because at this point, I, I haven't actually self-published. I used a little vanity press um, to, to publish it, which naturally ties your hands in some ways when you start talking about pricing. But... Um, 
Yeah, so, and I, but I didn't know enough to actually, like, I wanted to take that time when they were actually putting the book together, I wanted to take the time to learn how to do these things on my own around formatting and getting covers together and, and learning about the whole self-publishing business. So while they were actually doing the stuff I didn't know how to do, I was out learning how to do it. So um, That's fantastic. Yeah, Good. so hopefully the next one will be totally self-published. <laughs> so. Good. That's great. <laughs> do you yeah. ever find that you suffer from writer's block? I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, Kent. Do you ever find that you suffer from writer's block? Do oh, writer's get, block. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Good. Well, that's <laughs> probably the easiest one. <laughs> I have so many ideas running around in my head and so many voices. And um, there was a time when I actually thought I was schizophrenic. <laughs> so it was like what do you mean you don't hear people talking in your head? I hear a dog talking in my head all the time. So, and, and I actually thought it was a little strange, so I never really talked about it. And then I met an artist friend of mine named by the name of George Gallo, who um, is a screenwriter, director, and producer out in Hollywood. I actually know him because he's also an artist. And I interviewed him on my art chats with Linda Fissler, um, which is my <laughs> my art personality. And um, mm -hmm. I started talking to him, like, offline. We were talking to each other, and I said, I said, George, I said, really, um, you hear voices in your head? And he goes, oh, my God, every day. And I was like, <laughs> okay, we're fine. <laughs> you know, I'm not crazy. <laughs> so, so it was good. So, yeah. I, I agree. But because, I, I hear them, too. It's the characters, right? <laughs> yes, they're with you all the time. It doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, I could, you know, I, I'm also trying to write a, a, a little fantasy thing because Tolkien's a, a big, um, you know, one of my favorite artists. And, so I'm writing this thing called Tales of Regenus, and, and poor Artin's in the back of my mind. He's my main character in there, and he keeps coming in and going, hey, hello, remember me? <laughs> it's time to start writing on me. And I was like, okay, I just don't have enough hours in a day. I just, it's, so right now, no, no problem with writer's blocks. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, uh, who is your, so who is your favorite author? You just mentioned Tolkien. Is he your favorite Oh yeah, J.R.R. Tolkien um, is is absolutely probably my number one favorite. Um, and, and part of that was, you know, naturally I, I watched The Lord of the Rings, and um, I for Christmas I told Tom I said what I want you to do is find the seven original books that Tolkien wrote for The Lord of the Rings, and I said I want those seven original books, which. When the movie became big, they basically condensed this and they, they put it out in paperback in three books. And there was so much that was taken out of that, and I knew that. So that's why I asked for this little box set of seven, the seven original books, because, um, and, and some folks don't realize that there are, they were just these little books about, you know, an inch or so um, wide. And actually got it in the other room, but um, I started reading those, and it was so different, re it, totally different experience reading that. Uh, and I watched a lot of um, production um, video. I, I got the extended version of Lord of the Rings uh, downstairs, and it had a, a lot of conversations with Fran, who was the writer of the script, and and she also read the seven original books. And she was saying that you know she, trying to condense that down into something that could be you know told in a movie was very very hard. So. Um, there are poems that he wrote in this. Uh, there's a whole different description of the worlds that live down in Middle Earth and, or in the cultures, and it's just really amazing what he created. And I can see why. Um, I think it was C.S. Lewis that wrote the Chronicles of Narnia was a little bit jealous uh, of <laughs> yeah. Tolkien because, I mean, this it's just fantastic. He created the whole language, the old elf language that's used by everybody now he created mm -hmm. started to create that because he was such a dialect um you know he was so interested in dialects and languages that he, that he started to create that own language so that was just fascinating to me and i thought well you know i i didn't want to pick up writing about uh, middle earth because you know well number one the family doesn't want you to but number two <laughs> is <laughs> you know that that was his world so i i'm trying to create my own little world i i, I find that as the ultimate goal uh, and a writer to, to do that. Um, and then other art authors that are my favorite, it's like Ken Follett, um, Eye of the Needle. Uh, I found that the other day and was like, oh yeah, I remember reading that. So that had a little bit of influence on, on me as well. Um, Robert Ludlum, 
uh, wonderful writer. Uh, I only read a couple of his books because by the time the Carlos the Jackal escaped about four or five times, I had had enough. And, um, <laughs> you know, there's this, there, there's this line that you got to draw where you can only string people along for so long. And uh, he, he, about halfway through the second book, he was starting to lose me. And I'm talking about the Born, uh, the Born series, um, mm -hmm. Born Identity and, and all of those. I, I read Identity and... Um, at the end, Carlos gets away, and I said, okay, I'll give you one more book, and I read, started reading the <laughs> second book, and he gets away like two times before he gets to the end of the book, and of course, he gets away at the end of the book again, and I'm sitting there going, really, Robert, you're really talented. I think you can come up with another guy for this guy <laughs> to <run> down, <laughs> so, so I kind of like threw the book against the wall and said, that's it, and that's actually when I started writing Blind Influence, and I was actually writing it more from a, a spy novel than I was from the way that it came out. I actually um, backed off of um, doing all the spy stuff in the novel because I wanted it just, I wanted Sean to be there, but I didn't want it to be, I didn't want Sean to be the total fun focus of that. I wanted the three of them and the relationships to be uh, more the focus of, of the books. So what are you reading now? What am I, I'm reading um, all of my notes on for Love is Blind, which is the sequel. Oh, <laughs> so, that's great. So that answers yeah. my next question. What are your current projects? <laughs> so you're um, working on the sequel now. It, yeah, I'm working on the sequel, which is Love is Blind. Um, and uh, there's a little hint. The last, the, the first book ends with those three words, Love is Blind. And um, yeah, so there's a little teaser for you for the next book. <laughs> so I'm reading all those. I'm writing all those. And I wrote about... Um, Oh, I've got about 60,000 words written on that that I actually have to go back and read and, and come through and, and change because I'm, I'm so far along, but I've missed some, some things that I want to start adding in. So I'm in the middle of doing all of that. Um, also rereading some of the stuff that I wrote for the Tales of Regenus, um, Discovery of the Oracle, which is the first book in that series. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm rereading that as well, and I, I do have a stack of books that I should read um, sitting next to me, but I just, I don't really have the time to spend on, um, you know, reading for fun. I'm usually doing research or, or writing or writing, reading what I wrote so that I can, um, re you know, rewrite it or make it better or clean it mm -hmm. up, whatever, something like that. So, um I hate to disappoint folks, but <laughs> <laughs> and, and if, I, if I do, and if I, the weird thing is, is if I do get some time to read, I end up going back to Tolkien's books and reading uh, those seven books just because, I, like I said, I think they're so well written and they, um, they really tell a story, yeah. sometimes too much, sometimes too much <laughs> for me, but, you know, it, it, just, it, it, it just, I don't know, it just helps me think about how, you know, where he was and what he was doing and... Um, and then I guess the, the third thing I'm reading is I'm, I'm editing my um, From Brush to Palette Knife art instruction book. So uh, oh. that's the next thing that will be coming out. Yeah. So. Oh, lovely. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> if you had to do it all over again, would you change anything in Blind Influence? In Blind Influence? Probably not. I'm actually pretty Good. happy where Blind Influence is. If you're going to ask me if I'd change everything in my life up to now, <laughs> I'd probably say, yeah, I wouldn't work at Procter & Gamble. But <laughs> yeah, so. um, Let's see. Is there anything you find particularly challenging when you're writing? Uh, these are hard questions. Um, <laughs> when I write, I, you know, it's like, I guess what I probably shouldn't do is yell at my husband when he starts to talk to me and when I'm in the middle of writing. So I'll be sitting there writing and he'll ask me a question. It's like, what? Because all of a sudden I have to come out of that world and come back into this world. And, and I just look at him like, do you realize where I was? <laughs> like, I was in Washington, D.C. and you pulled me away from there. But um, now I, it's, I guess the challenging part for me isn't so much the free writing and, and getting everything down. The challenging part for me is editing and proofing. Um, and thank God for Esther Price Candies because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't get through <laughs> editing. But um, it's it's um, that's probably the hardest. And it's because I like to write so much, I like to free write so much that it just 
is very, very hard for me to, to go back and continually read over the same um, material trying to find all of the mistakes and the typos and the, you know, timeline issues and, and things like that. that. That's probably the hardest part. Oh, good. Uh, do you have any advice for other authors or writers? Um, actually, it's kind of interesting as I, uh, I was talking with someone, talking with someone this morning um, who described himself as a frustrated author, mm -hmm. and, and I just kind of laughed because it's like, I guess I'm so blessed that, you know, the first book out, it, it's, we just started actually, um, I consider the, pu the official published date for Blind Influence to be May 1st, and you know, here we are on May 14th, and I have a, an, a, an honorable mention already on the book. So I guess I, I feel very, very blessed that that has happened that way. And when I talk with other art, art authors who, you know, tell me that they're frustrated because they've been trying to work through and, and get things out there. And, you know, we all have frustrations, and it, it's just a matter of do what you love, and the rest will come uh, to you. And... Uh, just try to remain as positive as you can because remember that negative attracts negative things and positive attracts positive things. So if you continue, and, and that sounds, I know it sounds so hokey and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> it, you know, it, it really is true that, um, you know, I, I just, I, I, can, I know the frustration because I've gone through it on the art side. It, it's very frustrating and um, I I've, I've got to the point where it's like I don't do it for anyone else but me so on the art side you know I, yeah. I'm painting for me so I kind of I guess I started when I went into publishing actually publishing writing you know in books it was kind of like well I'm kind of doing this because this book always wanted me it, it was a story that wanted to be out there and wanted to be told and if you know if my friends are the only one that read it that's no different than where I was when I was eight years old and my friends and I were writing plays and putting them on for our other friends. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like we always did it for our friends. So, you know, I, I guess it, it really does mean something when folks say, don't, don't paint a painting because you think it's going to sell. Don't write a story because you think it's going to sell. You have to write what is inside of you and it will find the audience that it's supposed to find and it will find it eventually it's not going to find it when you first open the door and put it out there but it will grow as long as you keep by its side and support it and put it out there and stay behind it and something that you've written from your heart and something that you really feel um, is something that you want to say or a story you want to tell that will find the right audience given the time that is amazing advice Really yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> well, and, and don't get frustrated about it. You know, I mean, I have got a number of friends who are reading this book, and I get an email probably, like I said, I've been, I've been officially out there since, you know, this is the 14th day, and I've gotten, mm -hmm. you know, three, four, five, six emails already from people who have been reading it, and then they just come back and talk about, you know, how gripping it was and how well it's been written and, you know, how it's, how they didn't want to put the book down, and, you know, and these are, <laughs> these are basically just friends and people here in the little town I live in who are reading it that are getting back to me and just telling me how much they really enjoyed it. And, and now they're sitting there going, so when's the sequel coming out? And I'm like, will you let me launch this <laughs> book, please? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, like others to read it, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to have to come up with some short stories or something that's going to have to keep these guys <laughs> entertained until I can get the other one written. So <laughs> I think it's time for movie rights. <laughs> and can oh, you know, to everybody <laughs> You know, everybody keeps saying that to me. Um, everybody who has read the book has come back to me and said, this needs to be a movie, or I can see this as a movie, or something like that. And, and I'm like, you know, I got my fingers crossed because I'm going to be the person that's going to be standing. <laughs> I'm not going to direct it, okay, because I didn't go to school to, for directing, but I am going to be standing behind that director going, yeah, this is my book. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, I wish you good luck with that. I would love to see this movie. Uh, I agree with all of your fans. It really reads well like yeah. a movie. <laughs> I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it as a movie. So yeah. but we talked about this a little bit at the release party and who we wanted to play Sean and who we wanted to play. Uh, exactly. You know, I Nicole like your cast. And, and all that. 
<laughs> I like my cast. <laughs> Those are people I wouldn't mind meeting, I'll tell you. <laughs> so last I hope they like cougars. So. <laughs> Um, <laughs> lastly, do you have anything specific that you would like to say to your readers and fans? I didn't catch the last part, Nicole. Do you have anything that you'd like to say to your readers and fans? Oh, to, um, I thank you for reading it first of <laughs> all, and and uh, putting your faith in in me to uh, to actually you know purchase it and read it and. Uh, I hope it takes you on a, a wonderful adventure and, and that you find it as uh, entertaining as I found writing it. And um, you know, spread the word. Tell other people they have to read it too. <laughs> Excellent. That was very, very good. It was lovely talking to you today, Linda. Yeah. And um, we are going to talk about your book now and let everyone know where they can find it. So okay. right now Linda is on tour. You can find her tour. Oh, yes, that's a lovely <laughs> cover. <laughs> yeah, show it off. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah, that's the hard copy. That's so. amazing. That looks great. I need yeah. one of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll sign one and send it down to you, sweetie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you can find Linda's book on Amazon.com. It's currently 40% off on Smashwords yes. and Kobo, correct? And Kobo, yes. So okay. Smashwords and Kobos, you can, you can get uh, formats for your Kindle. You can get formats for your Nook. Um, Smashwords especially, I think there's like seven or eight different formats that you can look at. So they have one for everything. Excellent, excellent. And what is your website? Uh, my website that contains both information on my art and my book writing is uh, lindafissler.com, L-I-N-D-A-F-I-S-L-E-R.com. Perfect. And we can find her on Twitter at L. Fizzler and on Facebook at Blind Influence, correct? Blind Influence is the book page, yes. And mm -hmm. I'm also, um, I don't really have a, a personal account. I mean, I have a personal oh. account, but I uh, accept friend requests from anyone that would like to be friends and talk about writing and art and uh, put up with my dinner suggestions and, and recipes that I usually <laughs> post. <laughs> and sometimes my sarcastic wit, too. So, <laughs> Well, fantastic. Um, she's currently on a month-long blog tour. You can find her blog yes. tour um, on thebooknymph.com and follow each of her days. She has a $50 Amazon gift card giveaway going on right now. You can also have a chance to win some of her amazing art. So I would definitely yeah. enter. <laughs> Do you have some you can yeah. tell us? Awesome. Well, I got, I don't know, let's see. That, <laughs> I can't go in the wrong way. There we go. That, <laughs> that is actually where I spent, that's in France. That's in France. Yes. And I went bike I went bike riding through France and that's where we stayed. It was a little place called Maz de Flore and it was beautiful. And then this is from when I was in New Zealand. I probably can't see it because it's got plastic on it. Let me <laughs> little greeting cards. Where is it? There we go. Three little boats. It's amazing. Yeah, so Very impressionistic exciting. style. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you so yeah. much luck. You really deserve all of the great things that have Aww. happened to you so far. And I believe it's only going to get better. So <laughs> thanks for <laughs> chatting with me today. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You've been You're welcome. a big help, Kenya. I really appreciate um, <laughs> everything welcome. you've been doing for me. So <laughs> so it's been fun meeting you. So Thank you. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're going to stop broadcasting, and we will see you guys on Twitter, Facebook, and Linda's website. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs>